The softness, the comfort, the durability, the feel of cotton. The cotton belt covers the southern half of the United States from Virginia to California. Texas is the leading cotton producing state in the U.S. historically, accounting for approximately one third of the U.S. cotton crop. Many cotton farms are still family owned and operated on land that has been with them for several generations. Producers consistently deliver a plentiful supply of safe, low cost fiber, despite uncertain weather and economic conditions. And all of this must be done while taking care of the most valuable asset, the land. Variation in climate and soil require different production practices from region to region. Cotton's growing season is five to six months, the longest of any annually planted crop in the country. Planting begins as early as February 1st in South Texas and as late as June 1st in northern areas like Missouri and the Texas Panhandle. The first signs of the plant emerge within the first two weeks. About a month later, flower buds called squares form. These squares are followed in three weeks by creamy white blossoms. These blossoms quickly turn pink and then dark red before falling off. What remains ripens and enlarges into a cotton bowl. Bowls open approximately two months after bloom, letting air in to dry the white clean fiber and fluff it for harvest. Harvesting begins in July in South Texas and in October in more northern areas. Cotton is entirely machine harvested in the United States. The stripper harvesters of Texas and Oklahoma remove the entire bowl from the plant. In other areas, spindle pickers are used to pull the cotton from the open bowl. Revolving barbed spindles entwine the fiber and separate it from the bowl. From the fields, cotton moves to local gins for separation of lint and seed. The cotton goes through dryers to reduce moisture before passing through cleaning equipment. Revolving circular saws pull the lint through closely spaced ribs that trap the seeds. Finally, the lint is removed from the saw teeth. From the gin, fiber and seed go different ways. The gin fiber is pressed into 480 pound bales. To determine the value of the cotton, the grower sells the seed to the gin, which sells it for feed or to an oil mill. Here, the downy fuzz of the seed, called linters, is baled and sold to paper and plastic industries. The seed is processed into cottonseed oil, meal, and hulls. At the textile mills, the bales are opened and the lint is mixed and cleaned further. A machine finishes the job of cleaning and straightening the fibers and makes them into a soft, untwisted rope called a sliver. There are two types of spinning. Ring spinning is more common in the United States. But open-end spinning, which spins the yarn much faster, is becoming more widespread. The yarn is woven or knitted and is sent to a finishing plant where it is prepared for being made into clothing or products for the home. U.S. textile mills presently consume 6.4 million bales of cotton per year. The majority of that is converted into apparel and home furnishings and the remainder into industrial products. Industrial products containing cotton include wall coverings, book bindings, and zipper tapes. The biggest cotton users in this category are manufacturers of medical supplies, industrial thread, and abrasives. Natural rubber comes from the milky sap of a tropical tree. Thousands of years ago, the native people of Central and South America discovered that the hardened sap was elastic and bounced. They played games with the balls of sap. Today we make thousands of useful things from the fluid that circulates through rubber trees. Everything from tires to balloons to boots. 
The seeds are sown on plantations like this one in Thailand. It takes several years for the rubber trees to mature. Then the sap is ready to tap. In the coolness of the morning when the sap flows freely, the farm worker slashes the bark with a hooked blade. The sap oozes from the abrasion. It spills onto a metal spout inserted below the slashed section. The spout funnels the sap into a ceramic cup below. It flows for about five or six hours, partially filling the cup. They wait a couple of days for the tree to recover and then tap another section of the tree. After straining impurities, they pour the rubber sap into a plastic tub. They add formic acid and swish it around. The acid causes the sap to coagulate. After 15 to 30 minutes, it thickens to the consistency of tofu. This tofu-like sap has a sticky structure that allows it to now be rolled out like dough. The rolling squeezes out excess water and leaves a ribbed pattern on the sheets that increases the surface area to hasten drying. Then they rinse off the formic acid. They hang the rubber sheets to dry for about five hours. As they dry, the rubber thickens and becomes stronger and the color darkens. The coagulated rubber sap has been transformed. In a few short steps, it's gone from a liquid to a solid. When they're ready to move on, workers peel each sheet from the stack and soak them in water for about 20 minutes. This washes away some of the surface contaminants, but not all. The rubber sheets then go into a machine with many brushes that scrub off more of the dirt. After one more rinse, the rubber sheets are squeaky clean. They hang the sheets on racks to drip dry. They build a fire in a brick oven and smoke the rubber sheets in a chamber overhead for five days. After smoking, they clip out contaminants like bark or insects that have become embedded in the rubber. In many cases, they can't get it all. And then it's into a hydraulic baler. It presses the stack of rubber sheets into cube form. The dimensions of the cubes conform to international packaging regulations. We plant over 150 million trees in our plantations every year before they're transported to our mills to be turned into paper. Paper making actually involves various processes to turn that wood log into our everyday paper products. However, there are three key steps to the process of paper making. To kickstart the pulping process, the logs are debarked. The bark has to be stripped from the logs since it cannot be used in paper making. The water used is filtered on the spot and reused for other logs, reducing the amount of water wastage. Together with other byproducts of the manufacturing process, they are used to generate electricity to power up the mills and nearby towns. The debark logs are then chipped into small pieces before undergoing a process called chemical pulping. This process breaks down a chemical called lignin. And the result is pulp. Pulp is like a thicker, less refined version of paper. After being meshed, screened and dried, they can be used to make high volume commodity printing products like newsprint and magazine paper. It is pumped into a large paper making machine which stretches almost four times the length of an Olympic sized swimming pool and stands as high as a three story building. Starting at the first section called the head box, the pulp mass is squirted through a horizontal slit over a moving wire mesh to remove excess water. 
Here, the fibres begin to spread out and take the form of a thin sheet, thus giving this part of the process its name, sheet formation. Moving at almost 90 kilometres an hour, the thin mats are fed into the press section, where up to 50% of the water content is squeezed out. Things then start heating up as the sheets are dried at above 100 degrees Celsius over a series of cast iron cylinders. Film of chemicals is applied to the surface of the dried paper to improve the properties of the paper before being wound onto 8.5 metre wide jumbo reels. But of course, most of our printers can't print on paper of those dimensions, so the jumbo reels have to be cut up into smaller pieces. These smaller sheets of paper are then further processed before being wrapped and packed into our familiar Paper One packaging. The recipe for glass combines about a half a dozen natural raw materials, but the main ones are silica sand, soda ash and limestone. Silica sand usually makes up about 45% of the batch. The soda ash helps melt the silica evenly. It comprises about 15%. A limestone content of about 10% makes the finished glass more durable. They combine these ingredients with recycled glass called cullet. The factory's equipment feeds precise amounts of the materials into a furnace. Over a full day, the fiery heat, 2730 degrees Fahrenheit, melts everything together, producing a gooey liquid that's the consistency of honey. The molten glass pours out of the furnace. Shears cut the flow at precise intervals to produce cylindrical gobs. Each gob is the exact amount required to make one bottle or jar. They drop to a device called the scoop. The scoop moves them to troughs that feed them to jar forming and bottle forming machines. A gob of molten glass goes into a preliminary mold. In a matter of seconds, it comes out as what's called a parison, a miniature version of the final bottle. Each parison then moves into a blow mold the cavity of which is the shape of the final bottle. The equipment blows the compressed air into the parison, stretching the glass outward toward the wall of the mold cavity. This process creates the final bottle shape and hollows out the inside. These are amber-colored beer bottles. The color is produced by adding small amounts of iron, sulfur and carbon to the glass mix. The factory uses a similar manufacturing process to produce other types of bottles and jars. After the bottles leave the forming machine, they travel through flames. Otherwise, they would cool down too quickly and crack from thermal shock. The loader now gently pushes the bottles into what's called an annealing leer. The bottles cool at a controlled rate as they move through the leer. This releases stress from the glass gradually. As the bottles exit the annealing leer, a sprayer coats their exteriors with lubricant. This enables them to move smoothly through the rest of the inspection and packaging line. The bottles now line up in single file to head into the automatic inspection station. As the machine spins each bottle, cameras and probes check for imperfections such as cracks or bubbles. The inspection equipment then examines the top to check dimensions and ensure the threads for the screw cap are molded correctly. Before shipping, a worker does a final visual inspection. 